Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thanks so much for joining us today for our Lunar Landers program. I am so thrilled that you are joining us today. My name is Alicia. I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City. I'll be your host. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free. But if you'd like to support us in delivering this fun new content, we invite you to click on the link in the comments or in the description. So everyone, feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before or if you plan on visiting us sometime soon. And also, if you've got any questions today, feel free to pop them in there as well. So today we are going to be talking about spacecraft landers, specifically these things that have landed both here on Earth as well as on the moon and even other planets. But before we get to those, let's recap a bit about the Intrepid itself and our special connection to space. So to start off, everyone, this is the Intrepid Museum. We are located in a historic World War II aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. It was constructed way back in 1943 and is now a museum that's docked just a couple of blocks away from Times Square in Manhattan, right on the Hudson River. So maybe you've visited before or maybe you're looking forward to visiting us in person in the future. But either way, if you are in the neighborhood, it's kind of hard to miss. We like to say that the Intrepid is so big that if you were to stand it up on its end, it'd be taller than a New York City skyscraper. And it's also so long that you could just about play three games of football on it at the exact same time. Now, the Intrepid served in three wars, World War II, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War. And then a few years later in 1982, we became the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. But sometimes visitors get a little confused and they wonder, all right, why are we a sea, air, and space museum in particular? What's that space part all about? So let's rewind for a second. All right, so let's think. We are, of course, a sea museum because we are a naval ship, as you can see here. Uh, in fact, uh, on the right side there, this is one of the four propellers that were on the Intrepid. It pushed it through the water and is now inside on display at the Intrepid. So we've obviously got some pretty strong ties to the sea. You know, there's also a different type of propeller that we could talk about. Here's another one. This is a plane here. This is the Avenger from World War II, the oldest plane in our collection. It was a torpedo bomber, so you can actually see that torpedo underneath there. So this is just one of the reasons that we are an air museum. The propellers on the front of the plane there help to move it through the air. Now, the Air Intrepid carried a number of airplanes during its time in service. In fact, they could fit up to about 100 planes on the ship at any time. And it also had the ability to launch and land those planes, just like you might do at an airport. So it was basically a floating airport. Later on during the Cold War, we also had a bunch of jet planes like the Fury here that moved much faster and didn't use propellers. And we also even had some helicopters, which were used to rescue people from the ocean, too. So, all right, clearly, yes, we are an air museum because we are an aircraft carrier. That's what the ship is called, an aircraft carrier, carried aircraft across the ocean. We have a bunch of airplanes. We have a bunch of helicopters. But we're still not really sure about space. So take a look at this. All right, if you are walking around the hangar deck of the Intrepid, you are going to see this thing, and it is going to stick out quite a bit. There's a bunch of sea things, there's a bunch of air things, and then this thing. So does anyone know what this thing is? All right, tell me in the chat if you do. Does anyone know? We are looking at this big, black, almost kind of light bulb-shaped thing. It says United States on it. It's got a flag on it, right? Some people, when they look at it, they say it kind of even looks like an ice cream cone that's tilted on its side there, or even kind of like a megaphone that you might yell into. So this is a very special vehicle. Let me know in the chat also, if you happen to know, how many people do you think could fit inside of this thing as well? But I'll tell you, this thing is called a space capsule, and it is the thing that takes astronauts up into space, or at least this one in particular did many years ago. Now, capsules ride on the top of a rocket. The rocket, of course, is that thing that blasts off into space. There's lots of fire that comes out of the bottom of it, right? But then once it gets into space, it separates from the capsule. And then you've got this thing, this black kind of light bulb shaped thing here, again, floating around in outer space. 
So these capsules were part of some of the earliest stages of our space program, what they called Project Mercury, which was really just to see if people could even reach outer space in the first place and survive up there for a while. But this replica of one of those early capsules is called the Mercury Aurora 7. And anyone out there, if you said that maybe only one person could fit inside, yes, you would be correct. Taking a look at that, it is pretty small. Now, in 1962, the astronaut who went up into space in that capsule, Aurora 7, was named Scott Carpenter. And here he is next to the Mercury Atlas rocket that took him into space. So Scott Carpenter was actually only up in outer space for about five hours. He did three orbits or, you know, kind of spins around the planet there. Uh, and before then, eventually safely coming back down to Earth. But this one is actually really important. If you've got this big spacecraft, you know, hurtling back down through the atmosphere, you got to think about a good landing spot, right? Today we're talking about landers. So you don't want to land on someone's house or anything like that. And you also have to think about how you can land it safely, too. So they decided the best place for these capsules to land would be in the ocean. The Earth is about 70% water anyway, so it has a pretty easy target, right? A lot safer. And they figured it'd be a nice, you know, somewhat softer landing surface than on land on a mountain or in the desert or something. So Scott Carpenter landed in the Atlantic Ocean. All right. You can actually see on the, the side there on the right, there he is getting picked up. And you also might notice uh, on the picture on the left, some of these large parachutes that would come out to slow them down too. That one's from the Apollo landing a little later on. So these parachutes would come out to help to increase the drag, to help slow the capsule down as it started to come in so that it could get down to an even safer speed so that the astronaut wouldn't get hurt upon impact. So this, pretty good name for it, everyone. It's called Splashdown because it is splashing down into the water in the ocean. But you know, everyone, if something this big is going to land in the ocean, NASA still, of course, has to go pick it up and pick the astronaut up, right? You can't just leave them stranded in the ocean. So I mentioned, yeah, they sent out a helicopter to rescue the astronaut there. But then once they got him to a place he was supposed to be, they'd be able to then collect uh, the rest of the materials. They'd be able to collect the ship itself. But for this particular case with Scott Carpenter, everyone, when they went to go find him, they couldn't. The place that they thought he was going to be landing and he just was not there. And that is because while Scott Carpenter was wrapping up his mission, he had gotten just a little bit distracted by one of his experiments and he fired his re-entry thrusters two seconds too late. So as a result, he ended up splashing down over 200 miles off course. Well, fortunately, they were able eventually to track him down, but not after the whole world was panicked. Even Walter Cronkite was worried on the news and he said, we may have lost an astronaut. But eventually they found him. He was totally fine. He was just sitting out there in his raft, just munching on, you know, some food. He offered some to the diver that came to pick him up. Uh, and eventually then once they picked him up, he, they brought him to the closest airport that was in the water, which just happened to be the Intrepid, believe it or not. So here he is on board the ship. These are some photos from our collection. There he is surrounded by officers and onlookers on board the Intrepid after being picked up. Uh, from his capsule in 1962. So it was a very, very momentous occasion. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason why we are a space museum. The Intrepid played a very important role in retrieving astronauts and their capsules after they returned from outer space in those early years of the space program. Now, the Mercury capsule actually was not the only one that we picked up. We also picked up this one. All right, so the next series of missions were the Gemini missions, named what for? The constellation Gemini, of course, the twins. And they named it that because now this was the first time you might notice in this picture here that NASA sent up two astronauts into space together instead of just one, like we did in Mercury. Now, on board the Gemini 3 mission in particular, we had John Young, who you can see on the left, and Gus Grissom on the right. So these two astronauts went up into outer space. They orbited around the Earth three times. And then, same thing as before, they splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean. 
So here is a picture of the Intrepid retrieving the Gemini capsule from the ocean in 1965. And in these photos, you can see the yellow ring kind of around the ship there. All right. So uh, that is the flotation collar. And it was used to help the capsule to float while it's in the water waiting to be picked up. So if you've ever, you know, when you were learning how to swim, maybe when you were young, or if you have maybe a younger sibling, you've got those floaties you might wear on your arms, and it helps you to stay afloat. Same idea here. We had a raft to help it from sinking. We didn't want it to sink to the bottom of the ocean. One of them, unfortunately, did do that, but they were able to retrieve it later, and the astronaut was okay. Don't worry. So that it helps them to float. Um, they actually added this later in the missions because, yes, Gus Grissom, one of those astronauts, uh, on his first mission to space, um, he was the one that had the capsule that sank in his Mercury capsule. It was the Liberty Bell 7. Um, when he landed in the ocean, his door accidentally blew off, and the capsule started to fill up with water. Uh, and as I mentioned, yes, it sunk, but he was fine. He was rescued in time. Uh, the capsule, though, uh, sunk to the bottom of the ocean. It took him about 20 years to find it. So adding that floaty really helped to make sure that they were safe after landing. So these earlier NASA missions, everyone, it had a lot of experiments going on, lots of tests to see uh, how well humans would fare in outer space and how to get the equipment just right before heading off all the way to our main goal, which was, of course, the moon. Now, before we head on to the next era of space flight and beyond, I do want to pause right here and see if we've got any questions so far. So any questions at all? Why did they only send up two astronauts during the Gemini missions, right? So I mentioned before that the Mercury missions were pretty short, right? They only um, had uh, one person in the capsule before, like Scott Carpenter, for example. Uh, so NASA was really taking baby steps there. If you imagine each stage of NASA's missions as um, phases of like the, the growth cycle of a human, of a person, you can think of the Mercury missions kind of like a baby Right, so baby steps. Um, you know, you're you're a newborn. You're just learning how to breathe in space. You're just eating things like baby food, right? Or literally applesauce, like John Glenn did up there. Uh, very very simple motor skills, just figuring how to move around, survive up there, right? Now the Gemini missions are more kind of like the toddler stage, you could say, where you've got this opportunity now to uh, learn how to walk for the first time. So this is when we took our first extravehicular activity, so spacewalks. Um, also the first time that we docked with another ship. So um, that's like to say, you know, you're making friends in space maybe. Uh, and, and then, you know, you're able to do things like eat harder foods as well. Uh, so to answer the question uh, with Gemini in particular, um, that is, you know, again, it was part of this baby steps. So we didn't want to send a whole bunch of people up at one time just yet, just in case anything went wrong but we were still learning how to make things bigger, how to conserve energy, conserve fuel and oxygen, and think about the food up there, for example. So eventually we were able to get to the space shuttle era where you know we're sending seven, eight people at a time, but we wanted to do it slowly and sequentially, take our time and make sure that everything was a-okay. Uh, any other questions? Did all capsules land in the Atlantic Ocean? No, they did not. So uh, these two that we talked about so far, Mercury and Gemini, um, they did. But at the time, you know, they were being launched from Florida. So they were landing in the Atlantic down near around the Bahamas area. So it's easier for them to be able to retrieve the capsule. It was nearby. It could take it back to their headquarters and pull out any data they needed. Um, and also to learn, you know, anything else they needed to from the spacecraft itself. Uh, but the later missions landed in the Pacific. Uh, Apollo 11 actually, for instance, um, landed um, out there. And uh, that's the one that went to the moon, Apollo 11. Uh, and then there were other spacecraft that landed on land, too, even in the desert, which sounds a little unusual and doesn't sound very safe. But uh, I'll explain why and uh, how they were able to do it in just a bit. Um, but uh, other things, you know, also they landed on runways, which is a really great segue, actually, because before we talk about the Apollo missions, which came next uh, after Gemini and landed on the moon, I do want to skip ahead to another type of spacecraft that we used in order to go into space and then land back on Earth again. The next one, of course, which was this, the space shuttle. So this right here is the wonderful space shuttle enterprise that we are so lucky to actually have in our collection up on the flight deck at the Intrepid Museum. So this was the first space shuttle ever built. Very, very special. This is the prototype orbiter, the Enterprise. And when they were building this, the main goal was to transport large 
pieces of equipment, things like satellites and telescopes, um, pieces of the International Space Station going up into space so that it could hold, uh, you know, these, these large things, but also then hold more people. So this could hold about seven or eight people, but it also then again had this big payload bay in the back totally empty. So you can kind of think of the space shuttle like a large uh, trunk of a car or the back of a big truck even. And that area was used to bring up all of this extra equipment. So I'm going to tell you a big deep dark secret though about this particular space shuttle, the Enterprise. This particular one never went into outer space. It's true, but we do still love it. And it was still very important. This one was used as a testing vehicle. Again, it is something called a prototype. So they needed to see if something this massive, this is, you know, weighing very, very heavy about, you know, 160,000 pounds. So they wanted to see if it could actually even work and glide through the atmosphere with its airplane design and then land on a runway, just like an airplane. So remember before, you know, those capsules were one time use, they landed in the ocean and then they were recovered and then eventually they were just put into museums. But with this new design, NASA could actually reuse this spacecraft over and over and over again. Now, again, the Enterprise did not go into outer space, unfortunately, but it did get up into the sky. And here are some photos of an actual test flight that it did. Normally when these things went up, it, uh, you know, you see them, they're attached to a rocket with giant fuel tanks to the big orange hot dog thing and the white ones on either side that you might remember seeing. But this particular one did not use a rocket during testing. Instead, it got a piggyback ride from a 747 airplane. So back in 1977, this jet lumbered down the runway. It eventually took off with the space shuttle attached to its back there. And it went up to about 26,000 feet. It was going about 470 miles an hour, which honestly is not really that high or that fast. Commercial planes go much higher and faster even than that. But then once it got up there, it dropped it. So it separated and then the Enterprise became a glider, just like a paper airplane. Really all it had are those wings and the tail. It had the flight surfaces to help it to maneuver itself back down to the ground. And it did just that. It made banking turns to slow itself down and it just fell through the sky like a paper airplane. And then ultimately landed on a runway, just like an airplane at an airport. So these shuttles, when they came back, they didn't have you know any fuel or really any controls other than the ability to control the flaps on the wings and the tail to let it turn slightly until it landed with its wheels on the runway. And in this picture, you can see uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia landing at Edwards Air Force Base um, on one of its earlier missions. So after NASA was eventually satisfied with these tests, they made a few other changes, and then they created five other orbiters that were used to go into space. And then in 2012, a year after they retired the Space Shuttle program, the Intrepid Museum was lucky enough to receive one of the remaining shuttles. So there are only four of the six still remaining. Uh, they are in museums across the country. There's one in Washington, D.C. There's one in Florida. Uh, there's one in California. And then, of course, one right here in New York City at the Intrepid Museum. So come by and see it because it is amazing. Now, when the museum got the Enterprise back in 2012, we were so excited that we decided to celebrate it the same way it all began on the back of a 747 jet plane doing a victory lap around Manhattan, as you can see in this amazing picture here. So uh, if you were around in the city at that time, you might have even seen that amazing, very rare sight yourself. This looks like it's Photoshop, but I promise you it is not. Uh, and what's really, really special too on this photo is if you look directly underneath the plane and the Enterprise there, you can see the, uh, the Intrepid right there docked isn't that amazing? So all of our family there, the, the Intrepid, you got the planes, you got the Concorde on the pier, and then of course the Enterprise right up there on 747. How amazing. Now after space shuttles, we didn't stop going into space. In fact, we went back to using capsules, believe it or not, not space shuttles, uh, just like this one. 
So this is a real Soyuz capsule in our space shuttle pavilion. You can see the tip of the tail cone actually right up there above it there still of the Enterprise. Uh, and this particular piece has been into outer space. You can see the top part of it kind of where it's a little bit lighter on, on the top round part there. Uh, it's got scorched a little bit on re-entry. So there are some burn marks from all the friction going through the atmosphere. But this, this Soyuz capsule is what astronauts use to go into outer space after shuttles. So these capsules are sent up by Russia. And until recently, they basically just sold seats to the United States in order to get up to the International Space Station. Now, the Soyuz has three main parts to it. When it's in space, you've got the orbital module. So that is what's going to connect you to wherever you're going. So in this case, that's the International Space Station. So that is where it docks. That's number one there. You've also then got the re-entry module. That's the thing that you just saw. Uh, and again, originally it's covered in that silver stuff, but then it got a little scorched as it came back home. So that's the part that comes back through the atmosphere. Um, that is really the most important part because that's where your astronauts are going to be when they're coming home. And then the very last part, is this white area, number three at the end. This is the service module. So that has the heating and the cooling machinery and all of the other electrical components to make everything run. So let's say, let's imagine, all right, you are an astronaut. You are leaving the International Space Station and you are coming home to finish your mission. So you would climb into that re-entry module in the center, um, just like our friends here. You can see in the picture on the left, you can see three astronauts crammed in there, super, super tight. Uh, what's really interesting though about these is that they don't land in the water like our earliest capsules. These capsules took off from Kazakhstan near Russia and they were sent up by the Russian Space Agency. So it didn't really make a lot of sense to land it in the ocean since Russia isn't really near any water, right? That wouldn't make any sense to have them land all the way over in the water and then have to, you know, ship them all the way back to the center of the land or something like that. So instead, they landed in the desert. But because it's landing on dry land, they also had to think about it a little differently. They didn't have the softer water in order to protect them. So it's got some extra parachutes that help to slow it down. They come out and then again, that drag helped to slow them down. And then they also have explosives on the bottom that explode downwards to give it a little bit more of a last minute boost to counteract some of that speed when coming in for that landing. So you can see that in the picture on the right there. That is not it, you know, blasting into smithereens as it's landing. That's actually the retro rockets firing there and pooping out some of that dust and dirt. So that's pretty much the rundown of how we've landed spacecraft here on Earth, whether on land or on water. And next, now we are going to talk a little bit about landing on other places like the moon and other planets. Um, I see a comment in the chat there, too, uh, talking about, can you get a SpaceX capsule next? That would be kind of cool, right? But actually, to mention, um, you know, some of the things that we've seen recently with people going into space like Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos, right? So I know, for example, the the um, Richard Branson flight, for example, when he came back down, he landed just like our space shuttle does, this, this idea of a space plane. Uh, so you are able to go up. That one was kind of cool because it actually went up and then it separated off, kind of like how the fuel tanks come off of the space shuttle actually. Um, but it had that rocket booster that separated off and then eventually when it came back down, it landed on a runway as well. So they're still using these ideas right now um, too uh, with all of these billionaires going into space. All right, so before we move on everyone to talking about landing in other places like the moon or other planets, um, I wanna see if we have any more questions here. Any other questions? Uh, why was the space capsule, uh, space, the Soyuz capsule, excuse me, used? So Soyuz capsule was used again because we stopped using space shuttles. So again, in 2011, they retired the space shuttle program. And really the reason for that is just it came down to the fact that it was very expensive and also kind of dangerous. Unfortunately, uh, we did lose two of our space shuttles and the astronauts who were on board. So they decided, you know, the risk uh, just didn't necessarily outweigh what they were doing at the time while using those pieces of spacecraft. Um, also, their funding was cut, which, as you know, is a reason that a lot of things end up going by the wayside. So it came down really to money and they realized it would just be easier to buy tickets, to buy these seats on board the Soyuz capsules um, that were put up by Russia to get to the International Space Station. Um, again, the ISS, many countries are all working together up there. So we thought, yep, we are all going to work together too. We're going to use the Soyuz capsule to get up there uh, in the meantime until now, of course, we are launching uh, spacecraft from 
our home uh, as well, back in Florida again. Cool. Any other questions? How heavy was the space shuttle? Very, 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 very heavy. So again, it is this huge thing. You've got all this equipment. Um, first of all, you've got the actual orbiter, right? So that is the big white plane looking thing that we just saw. Um, then you've got what's in the payload bay. So anything that goes inside of those doors that open up uh, that, that trunk of a car, basically, um, that could be you know a satellite or a telescope or um, a, a piece of the International Space Station, whatever it is that you're sending up there, that's going to add more weight. Uh, plus, then you've got the people on it, anything they need to take with them, like food or anything else going up there. And that is a lot. All empty. Uh, it weighs about 165,000 pounds. But then you have to think about all that extra stuff, plus all of the fuel that you need to get it up there. And at the end of the day, you know, you're pushing about, I think it's 4.4 million pounds. Uh, so, you know, when you see those space shuttles actually go up again with those giant hot dogs, uh, fuel tanks, when you saw those go up before, um, that is all that liquid fuel. They've also got solid fuel in the two white boosters on the side. And those tanks don't even make it all the way into space. They burn through all of that stuff and then they detach and they fall back down to Earth. So that's going to make it a little bit lighter so it can get that final boost to break away from Earth's gravitational pull. Uh, and then... You know, you're in orbit going around up there on the planet, and then again, it lands on the runway. So there are some components that can be reused, like the orbiter. Um, also, the uh, solid fuel tanks, though the white ones on either side, they would be able to dredge those up from the ocean after they landed um, and then, you know, reuse those. Uh, but the the orange one actually just burnt up on reentry. Uh, but again, all those things together, super, super heavy. <laughs> These things weigh a lot for sure. Now, as you know, everyone, uh, in 1969, the United States successfully landed humans on the moon. And the three guys that were part of that mission are right here. So uh, from the left, we have Neil Armstrong. In the middle, we've got Michael Collins in the center, who was the command module pilot. Uh, he actually stayed in the capsule waiting to pick them back up again. So I kind of like to say he's like their getaway car after they landed on the moon, and then Buzz Aldrin on the right. So the two guys sitting down in the front actually stepped foot on the moon. Now, landing on the moon is a little bit different than landing on Earth, as you can imagine, but let me know in the chat, why do you think that is? Why do you think it's a little different? What is different about Earth and the moon, specifically? Why would we have to think about some of these changes. Uh, because, you know, even though the moon is pretty close to Earth, relatively, there are still very, very, very uh, different and important things to consider there. Um, and that means, of course, landing is going to be a little bit different too. So first of all, some of these things we can talk about are the terrain, right? The terrain is completely different. There's no oceans of water like we have here on Earth. Uh, the moon is this rocky terrain, craters everywhere because things are constantly smashing into it all of the time. Um, and it takes, you know, a lot of that space debris that might come and hit us it acts like a bodyguard sometimes and shields us. So there's lots of these impact craters, these big holes. Uh, and probably, you know, you wouldn't want your astronaut necessarily to land in a very bumpy spot, maybe on an edge of that, right? Or, or somewhere where there's a lot of other debris that might have broken off there. So it could be a little bit tricky. Uh, also, the Earth has an atmosphere. So that is that bubble, that protective bubble around our planet that helps to keep the air in, the air that we breathe, surrounds us. And uh, that is actually the reason that we can use parachutes in the first place. Um, those, of course, the things that come out to slow down uh, the spacecraft or you if you jump out of a plane for some reason. So the parachute can actually use that air to slow your fall down. Uh, and that's because we have an atmosphere holding all that air in. But the moon doesn't have an atmosphere to hold in air. So parachutes aren't really actually going to do us any good up there either. Now, if you've ever seen footage of any astronauts on the moon, you might see something like this, right? They're bouncing around a lot. Kind of fun to watch this footage. This old footage from the 60s, right? Them bouncing around. Very, very unusual. We're not used to seeing that. Um, it does take a little bit longer for them to, to bounce and come back down to Earth. Um, that's because the gravity is a little bit different on the moon. It is about one-sixth of what it is here on Earth. So that's also going to affect your landing strategy, too. So scientists had to come up with something completely different and really think outside of the box. And this is what they designed. So this is a model of what put the first humans on the moon and then brought them back home safely again. Uh, so again, here, this is the lunar module. Here, we've got the service module, first of all. 
All right, number one there, that has all of the heating and cooling and electrical components, all right? Then we've got the command module, number two. So that's what comes back home again and lands in the ocean. Uh, the thing that Michael Collins was, uh, you know, driving the, the getaway car as he was going around the moon waiting for them. And then we have number three, this part here. This is the lunar module. So when the Saturn V rocket took off, it only actually had parts one and two on it. Um, there was another rocket that took up um, the last part while they were in space. And that is when they were able to connect that third part, the lunar module to it. And how did they learn to do that particular docking maneuver? Well, that was one of the things that they were testing out during the Gemini missions, actually. But the lunar module was actually a really, really amazing vehicle because it had ultimately the capacity to land us on the moon. Um, it was made here on Earth, but it was only ever actually used while in outer space, which also meant they never were able to test it. So they crossed their fingers. They really thought, all right, this is going to work. They did lots of tests, but they couldn't actually test it because they hadn't sent it into space yet. But it's amazing, really, <laughs> the brilliance of these people to do that uh, and the fact that it all worked. We were very lucky. So this is what it looked like when it landed. It looks kind of funny, right? This is the LEM, the lunar module, all right? Uh, let me know in the comments uh, what you think this kind of looks like. Does it look like anything to you? It looks a little silly. Um, really unlike anything else that we've seen before. And to me, I don't know, it kind of looks like a bug. Kind of you see like a shiny spider. So maybe those legs sticking out, that gold part. Um, you can actually see that those legs are hinged. And that's really important because you don't want the astronauts to go ricocheting, right? Bouncing off the ground when they land. So it used retro rockets instead of a parachute, first of all, to slow it down, um, to power its descent coming down. Again, it didn't have the, the drag to have the parachute. So firing some rocket thrusters there helped it to, like I mentioned with the Soyuz capsule, which came afterwards, uh, helped it to slow down and then eventually could land on the moon. And because the legs took a lot of that shock on impact, the astronauts wouldn't uh, necessarily have to, you know, it wouldn't fall over, it wouldn't break off, and they wouldn't take a lot of that um, power as it's coming down. Uh, and then the rest is history, right? So they did great work up there. And then when they were done, they climbed back into the lunar module, which is up here, the top part. Uh, and then the golden part at the bottom, that part is called the descent stage. So that part had the thrusters to um, power you back down to the surface when you first were landing. Um, but that was really the only time they needed to use that. So they didn't need it anymore. They left it there. The top part there, it kind of looks like a face, kind of like the Transformers logo, I think. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, this part is called the ascent module. So that part separates and goes back up to meet with the command module, which is, remember, still floating around. Michael Collins ended up there waiting for them. So they go up. They're able to connect up there and then go back home. And then when they get home, they are able then again to safely land in the ocean and we're picked up again. So that's landing on the moon. Now, what about landing a little further away even? What about something like Mars, right? Mars has been all over the news quite a bit because earlier this year, of course, we landed the Perseverance rover there. It's doing amazing things up there. But prior to Perseverance, we can't forget about some of our other famous, fabulous rovers up there who landed on Mars. Of course, here are two of them. We've got Spirit and we've got Opportunity. Now you may look at these and go, wait a minute, Alicia, you made a mistake. That looks like the same image twice. But no, no, my friends, your eyes are not deceiving you. Those are twin rovers. They look exactly the same. So we sent twin rovers up to Mars, and now we are going to play a little game, everyone. I'm going to ask you a few questions about them. Let's see how much you know about our Mars rover twins. So I'm going to ask you a question, and if you think I'm talking about spirit, type a one in the chat. And if you think I'm talking about opportunity, type a two in the chat, okay? So here's our first question, everyone. Which one went the furthest? So which one traveled the farthest? Give me a one or a two in the chat. If you think it's spirit, type one or opportunity, type two. Now, both of these rovers were sent up to Mars to drive around the surface. And uh, there is a couple of a minute's delay between the commands that we send here on Earth um, to you know, get all the way out to Mars to them. But we can actually control rovers remotely from here on Earth. So think about this. Think about how far, you know, you think they might have gone. Which one do you think went the furthest while actually on Mars? One for spirit or two for opportunity? 
So everyone, if you said two opportunity, you would be correct. Opportunity went a grand total of 28 miles, whereas Spirit only went about 4.8 miles. But there's a reason for that. Now, you know, it's not really that far, right? But they had slightly different things that they were looking at, too. So that's okay. And again, we were still sending it all the way to another planet. So let's give them a break, right? 28 miles is a good job. Good job opportunity. All right, next question here. Which one got some help from something called a dust devil? Now, what is that, you might ask? Well, Mars has lots and lots of dust across its surface. It is famous, of course, for that red, rusty dust everywhere. Uh, and it is actually um, a dust storm, really. So dust blows around all the time on the surface of Mars, and it gets everywhere. So what ended up happening was dust blew onto one of these rovers and its solar panel sensors. So that's where it gets its power from, right? So it blocked them with all that dust, and it wasn't getting any power from the sun, so NASA was just like, okay, well, <laughs> I guess that's it. It's done. It's over. It's dead. But luckily, a dust devil came along. So a dust devil is basically this mini tornado of swirling dust and wind. And it just came along and just blew all that dust right off the panels and brought it back to life. So there you go. So which one was it that that happened to? Was it spirit type one or was it opportunity type two? What do you think? Got some ones, got some twos. All right. And the answer, everyone, is spirit. And since you're probably curious, everyone, here is a picture of a dust devil. Look at that. It is a swirling column of dust that just moves across the surface. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of like a mini tornado. Um, not strong enough to knock it over, thank goodness, but just enough to kind of give it a little breeze to knock off some of that dust that was on top of the solar panel. So thank you, dust devil, for bringing our fabulous spirit back to life. Now, next question, which one of these had a broken wheel that made a great discovery? Was it spirit or was it opportunity? Type a one if you think it's spirit and type a two if you think it was opportunity. So this one, whichever one it was, all right, had a broken wheel. And because the wheel was broken, it helped it to figure out something really, really special and really, really important about Martian soil. Hmm. All right. And get those answers in. All right. And the answer is spirit again. So spirit had a broken wheel that helped us to discover something really cool. Uh, if you take a look at this, all right, you're probably wondering, well, what am I looking at? This just looks like dirt. <laughs> what is this? Well, they studied this dirt because as spirit was moving along, it had a broken wheel, right? And it was dragging that broken wheel along. This is also the one that didn't go as far. You might recall it was only about five miles. Um, that's why. It, but as it was dragging its wheel, it uncovered this stuff here, this light stuff. This is silicates, which are really, really good indicators of the presence of light. So this doesn't mean that there is currently life there, of course, but maybe at some point in the past, Mars might have had life. And it's all thanks to that broken wheel that we actually got a closer sense of that. And that, of course, is now what is, uh, you know, spurring on our next phases of exploring Mars to see if there might actually have been some life there. All right, so last question, everyone. Which rover had the longer mission length? Now, both of these rovers were launched in the summer of 2003, pretty close to each other at the time. So which one had the longer mission length? Was it Spirit, Type 1, or Opportunity, Type Two. What do we think? Spirit or opportunity? Which one had the longer mission length? All right. So we got some twos. All right. Got some ones. And everyone, the answer is opportunity. Good job. All right. So opportunity had the longer mission. Spirit's mission was six years long probably because of all of the problems that Spirit was having. We already talked about with that broken wheel and all that. But Opportunity's mission was 16 years long. So really amazing lifespan there. They both did a lot of really, really important work for NASA though along the way. So we love both of them. Now, how did we land a rover on Mars, right? Because Mars is different than Earth. Again, there's no oceans. Also different than the moon. Mars has gravity. Again, it's a little less than Earth, but it's still there. It also has an atmosphere, 
but it is a lot thinner than that we have here on Earth. So the parachutes do still work there, though. That's something to think about. Um, and also, though, we are landing this thing really, really, really far away. So there is always going to be a bit of a delay between when we send signals and then when it receives it and knows what to do next. So imagine, you know, being in this very urgent, uh, you know, free fall state needing to send uh, instructions, but you have to wait a few minutes before it gets there. I mean, that's you really got to plan this out, right? So this is how they did it, all right? This is similar to a Soyuz capsule, all right, where they send out the parachutes to slow it down. They also fired, as you can see here, these retro rockets to slow it down even more and then stabilize it under, uh, or stabilize it like the lunar lander did on the moon. Uh, but even further down, we can see something else that kind of looks like a bunch of grapes. Do you see that right down here, hanging down here? So these bunch of grapes at the bottom, right? So inside of those grapes is where the rover is. So these are these big giant balloon things. They land, they actually bounce, all right? So imagine hitting the, the surface of the Mars there and it bounces around, all right? It bounces until it settles, okay? It settles on the surface of Mars. And then once it gets to a nice resting area, here it is bouncing around. And then once it gets to a nice resting area, everyone, it can settle. It calms down, and then these balloons actually shrivel up. All right, they deflate. Uh, they kind of look like raisins or like a brain there. All right, but all the air comes out of the balloons, and then it opens up to reveal this little golf cart sized rover. But everyone, of course, these are not the last uh, rovers that we sent to Mars. Uh, we have since then sent Curiosity. And also, of course, again, Perseverance. Now, they got to Mars a little bit differently. And let's see how, all right? I'm going to show you a video of Curiosity landing on Mars. Um, so this is a computer animation, of course. We didn't have video footage then. Uh, but they call this the seven minutes of terror because during this time period, again, we don't really know what's going on with the rover. We lose all communication because the interference with the Martian atmosphere. And again, there's that delay. So it's a lot of holding your breath and crossing their fingers and hoping and praying that this is going to work. So I'll talk you through this now, everyone. Um, and here we go. I'll make it bigger for you so you can see as we go here. So here we go. So this is going to be Curiosity landing on Mars. All right, so the first thing we're gonna see, everyone, is the top part separate. So that's kind of the guiding system and it goes away. So now we've got this capsule coming into the Martian atmosphere. As it comes down, it's going to start to correct itself, like you can see there, to put most of its bottom facing the ground of Mars. There's gonna be generating a lot of friction there, a lot of heat. So it, you can actually take your hands, you know, rub them together really fast. That generates friction and that's sort of what it feels like, except a lot hotter, right? And we want to make sure we're safe from that heat. So there is a heat shield there to help to deflect the heat. So it's going to move away from the main part of the capsule once it starts to come in there. So it's coming in now. There's all that heat being generated. All of that going around it. But you can see that shield is very much helping it. Uh, it starts to stabilize itself. All right, still moving really fast. And then pretty soon now, as it's coming in, you are going to notice, here it comes wobbling a little bit, it's stabilizing itself. All right, so now, there we go. Now you see the parachutes. Right after the parachute that you have that heat shield come off, you don't need that anymore, but that also comes off because there's a camera underneath the rover. It's taking pictures of Mars as it comes in for a landing, checking in real time to make sure there's no rocks in the way of its sight. And then at a certain height, we don't need the parachute anymore, so it detaches. Then we're going to fire our retro ro rockets to slow us down even more. Those rockets can't get too close to the surface, so we need to make sure that there's not a lot of shock because we don't want it to break. So it pulled out that thing called the sky crane. So that is what the last part was that you just saw. The sky crane lowers the rover to the ground and then it safely separates. And there you have it. That is pretty much how we also were able to land the Perseverance rover uh, earlier this year as well. And everyone, here is uh, a selfie taken by Perseverance. Kind of an animated GIF here, kind of cool. Um, it's a selfie of Perseverance. This is an actual photograph, everyone, on Mars. Um, it was taken with its robotic arm back in April. 
But Perseverance is the newest rover to land on Mars, whose mission, again, is specifically to search for signs of past life. Uh, past or present life, actually, I should say. And something else really cool about Perseverance is that it has a little drone, too, which you can see in the selfie here, right in the back area over here, a couple meters away. Uh, and that's that drone, it's a little helicopter that you can see in that selfie there, too. It's called Ingenuity. And that is flying around the surface of Mars, right? We are just doing unbelievable things right now, testing out uh, the atmospheric pressure, testing out gravity, digging through the, the, uh, the dirt, getting some rock samples again. We're learning so much more now. Technology is just so incredible. And Perseverance is just plugging away up there, doing great things. Here's another fun fact, too, actually. They uh, attached a small piece of the wing covering from the Wright Brothers' original 1903 Wright Flyer. So that's the very first powered aircraft here on Earth. Uh, they attached it to a cable underneath that uh, little helicopter's solar panel there, too. So there's a little homage to our first steps of flight here on Earth, but up there on Mars. Um, and also, actually, another fun fact, too, in 1969, for the moon landing, Neil Armstrong also carried something similar from the Wright Flyer to the moon in the lunar module as well. So, again, kind of, uh, you know, honoring our predecessors of flight as we are doing absolutely unbelievable things on the moon and on Mars and who knows, maybe even beyond in the future, too. All right. So as we round up the program, everyone, I'd love to see if we have any last questions. Any more questions tonight? Have the rovers come back from Mars? So no, once they're there, they stay there. Mars is really, really far away. Um, it takes a little over eight months just to get there. And we also don't really have anything to launch them back home again, unfortunately. So um, they just send us back data through signals right now um, until you know they, they die for whatever reason up there. But I do think that once we send astronauts to the surface of Mars, eventually one of their missions is going to be to bring back some of the smaller things that we've sent there, like Pathfinder, uh, which is a really small rover that went up before the twin rover, Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, so bringing home, um, you know, maybe more for sentimental value than anything else. Uh, but I do know actually that uh, some of the samples that are being drilled right now with Perseverance, the idea, if this works, is to, they've got these little kind of like test tube size tubes, um, and they're putting them into a canister and Theoretically, the idea is that they will launch them from the surface of Mars remotely, and then we'll send another ship to come intercept it. Imagine like a football being thrown up into space and then catching it. <laughs> um, but eventually they'll be able to catch it. I guess they'll launch it into orbit maybe and then eventually pick it up. And then that will remotely be able to be sent home. So maybe we might be able to get some samples of the Martian soil uh, sooner than when we send a person. But who knows? That's still up for debate, too, if that's going to work. Um, all right. Maybe time for one last question. Is someone controlling the probes like a remote control car? Oh, yeah. So essentially, um, like I mentioned before, there is a delay. So you kind of have to wait for that signal to go before the rover can accept whatever command that you're you're sending there. And uh, you have to pay attention to you know what it's sending back as well, because you don't want to end up in a ditch somewhere upside down, right? I'm sure we've all had that experience when you're driving a remote control car and it flips upside down and its wheels are spinning and it's not going anywhere. It's a turtle on its back, right? And so you have to go over and you know fix the car and put it right side up again for it to work. But we can't just, you know, pop over to Mars and flip over our rover. So they have to be very, very careful because you can't always rely on something like a dust devil to just swing on by and fix it for you. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure there are mechanisms on board the rovers to help to stabilize it. Or maybe if that does happen, maybe there is a way for it to kind of flip over. But they have to two-way communication there. You really have to listen to what the rover is sending you and also be very cautious about what you're sending and think about timing too. Great questions, guys. All right. So my friends, that concludes our Lunar Landers program for today. Uh, if you have any other questions about our programs, you can reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through any of our social media platforms. Be sure to follow or subscribe to this channel and visit our website for our upcoming programs as well. Our next family program is going to be Tuesday at 3 p.m., High Flying Design, where we're going to talk a little bit about how things like planes and helicopters are able to fly and the four forces of flight that help them out, too. So be sure to tune in for that. We also have a short feedback survey that we'll link to in the chat that we would love to get your your feedback about uh, on this or other programs that you might have seen, too. So if you've got a second, 
we would love for you to fill that out for us. And lastly, as a reminder, our museum is now reopened to the public seven days a week from 10 to 5 p.m. So if you are in the area or passing through this way, we would love to see you back at the museum as well, uh, where you can see, of course, our space shuttle or the Soyuz capsule for yourself in person too. So thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in today. And hopefully we will see you around for an upcoming Intrepid Adventure. Thanks so much, everyone. See you next time.